Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. In the name of our risen Lord. Amen. I sometimes think of this Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, as Second Thought Sunday. The stone has been rolled away by now. Here at church, all those splendid flowers have been trucked away or sent out to folks around these surrounding towns. We've proclaimed the resurrection, but the crowds by this Sunday always thin. And then suddenly we meet Thomas, the twin, one of the remaining 11 disciples. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, I, he insists, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side. He's so specific. I will not believe. There is something so natural to me in Thomas's response to this story of a risen Lord he hears from the other ten. The author of John's Gospel understands, I think, just how natural such a response is. He writes of Thomas in this unforgettable encounter, he says, so that we too, we may believe as he did. Scripture recounts the story of Thomas to us, I think, in anticipation of our own second thoughts, in order to make space for our own second thoughts. It's a way of recognizing and honoring them, actually, because Thomas's questions are our questions. His longing for proof is our longing for proof. If you have questions about your faith, if you're plagued by second thoughts, if something in you depends on your own eyewitness account, always take heart. You're not the first. This is the wonderful thing about Thomas. His story honors our own questioning, our own moments of unbelief. And all of these, I think, are part and parcel of our life together in Christ. In 1979, when I was about 15, and preparing for confirmation in the Roman Catholic Church, I attended Wednesday night catechism classes in the home of Mrs. A, a volunteer from our parish. While about 10 of us teenagers sat on her couches, sipping Dr. Pepper and munching Pringles potato chips, Mrs. A taught us about our faith. She taught us about the Eucharist, she taught us about the importance of making regular confession. She even horrified the ten of us by washing our feet during Holy Week. But whenever she had an opening, Mrs. A would turn the conversation deftly to her favorite subject, the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin. This relic is probably familiar to you. Periodically, and often at this time of the year, the Vatican authorizes its viewing. A linen cloth about 14 feet long and 3 feet wide, the shroud bears the image of a man whose wounds are consistent with death from crucifixion. There are even tiny scars around the temples, identical to the marks that would have been left by a crown of thorns. Carbon dating has disproved the authenticity of the shroud, but for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, many Christians have believed that this cloth was the very cloth that enfolded the crucified Christ, that the image burned into the cloth as an ancient sort of photographic capture of Jesus at the exact moment of resurrection. Now, the Shroud of Turin was very big business in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And Mrs. A always seemed to have a new paperback about it with pictures to pass around for us to see. I think she liked talking about this with us because 
It was something that held our teenage attention spans. In a kind of Leonard Nimoy, unsolved mysteries kind of way. Teenagers, after all, can be easily bored by abstractions. I'm still that way sometimes. But here it was, proof positive. He had risen. And just like Thomas, we could see it for ourselves. I've wondered recently, recently why there was such a flood of books and articles about the Shroud in the late 70s and 80s. I've wondered if fascination with the Shroud, with a longing for proof positive of Christ's resurrection was connected with a larger dynamic of fear and doubt that seemed to be a new part of American life when I was 15. Thomas's doubt to me seems rooted in a context of fear and insecurity. They're living in a room locked for fear of the Jews. Perhaps the Jew they are fearful of the most is Jesus himself coming back for some sort of retaliation, a retaliation that will not come. But they have every reason to believe that the world has suddenly become a very dangerous place. In his book, Decade of Nightmares, Decade of Nightmares, the religious and cultural historian Philip Jenkins writes about how Americans, in the years between Watergate and the first inauguration of Ronald Reagan, also began to perceive new dangers in the world. According to Jenkins, this period saw a sharp increase in perceived threats to American security, both at home and abroad. The first domestic news stories I remember connecting with as a young adult, as a teen, seemed to be dominated by stories of monstrous criminals, serial Killers, child abusers, satanic cults, predatory drug kingpins, Jonestown, Guyana, the assassination of Harvey Milk. International news in this particular period focused on Soviet expansion into Afghanistan, the threat of nuclear war, OPEC's stranglehold on global oil, and American hostages in Tehran. Religious rhetoric, according to Jenkins, hardened hardened during this time, historically, all over the world, between and among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Particularly in America, strident religious fundamentalism and all sorts of apocalyptic fear became a new and divisive force in our culture. Our doors were locked for fear of the other. In many ways, they still are. Perhaps we've added a few bolts in these decades. Whenever there's energy under gun laws, for example, in our culture, most recently in response to the murders in Nashville, the result for one part is booming handgun sales and a proposition that seems to me deeply flawed and fraught with potential complication, armed guards in public grade schools, is a notion that is gaining and continues to gain traction in our country. The mystery here, in a context of fear, whether behind locked doors in the upper room or in our own jittery age of perceived threats and insecurity, the mystery and the power given to us is belief. It's natural, I think, to long for a tangible supporting sign. The rational part of us looks for proof, the image on the shroud that fascinated me and Mrs. A, the wounds that Thomas names for us this week as the necessary hard evidence for his own belief. In its Greek root, though, and you'll hear this from me regularly. The word believe has very little to do with the rational part of us. To believe, credo, it means to give one's heart to. And Thomas reminds us this week that it's hard to give one's heart sometimes. 
when, like Thomas, you have witnessed the betrayal and passion of your Lord and Savior, when your own fears have caused you to forsake him, when new dangers are abroad in the land and we're living behind locked doors. How easy it is in such times to fold in upon yourself. We mark this week the 10-year anniversary of the marathon bombings. My work had me in the back bay at that time, and I remember how frightened we all were, how suspicious of the abandoned knapsack of the suitcase that someone had left in the church narthex. To say no to belief and the risk of more trauma and pain in a world that is hostile and dangerous seems the right of way. To say, I can't believe this, I will not believe this until I can see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe, is a temptation in times of danger. I will not believe. If I, for example, were the mother of a child who'd been killed by a gun, the wife or child of one of the fishermen who periodically vanish in the waters off our coast, I'm not so sure I could let myself hope until I see him walking through that kitchen door. I will not believe, I will not hope for a life to come. This is Thomas. This can be us. But notice the response of the other disciples, the response of Jesus himself to Thomas's doubts. Is Thomas cast out because he's not yet fully on board with a new understanding? Is he barred from the upper room? Is his membership card yanked away from him? Is he berated by the others for falling short? Not at all. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Thomas was with them. It's as if the group has begun to grasp a truth we learn in community, that there is no correct way to grieve loss. Loss is where they're living, and perhaps, like your own families living through occasional shattering loss, people can be all over the place. There is no enforceable timeline for the return of hope and belief. Waiting for hope, waiting for belief, we live there sometimes. So likewise, when Jesus appears for the second time this Sunday, he speaks to Thomas with the patience of a loving parent trying to explain thunder and lightning to a terrified five-year-old. His words seem rooted to me in a kind of tender regard. He does not scold Thomas. Instead, he invites him to reach out his hand and touch him. Reach out your hand. Do not touch, but believe. Personally, I often hear the invitation to believe as an invitation to think to use my intellect, but the exchange between Jesus and Thomas is taking place on a different level entirely. Touch me, says Jesus, give me your heart. Believe, do not fear. He's not constructing an argument, he's not reasoning, he's simply offering himself and his love. Extending an invitation to cast out fear and to step through a mysterious door called faith. In a way, this upper room is like the tomb. When Jesus appears there with his words of comfort, peace be with you, he'll say that three times, peace be with you, he is, in a sense, unlocking a door, rolling a stone away, dissolving terror, suspicion, insecurity, calling the apostles themselves out of the cave of their own fears, out of their own decade of nightmares, and back into a world in desperate need of their mutual faith, their charity, and their saving love. What Jesus offers Thomas, what our gathered life as a church, as the body of Jesus now, offers us, is not explanation, 
but experience. He's offering an experience. The kind of experience that only comes when we are willing to show up, to reach out our hands, to make ourselves available to things we may not understand. I think there's something so true about the life of faith in this exchange. Faith is never a response to an explanation. It grows out of experience. When I remember catechism 30 years after the fact, more, perhaps the miracle was not the shroud that Mrs. A loved to talk about, but something more subtle, perhaps, only perceptible with time and insight. It was her witness to us, her love for Jesus Christ, her willingness to give us her time and to open her home to us. Mrs. A had three high-maintenance children herself, one with a severe learning disability, another with a deepening drug addiction. She had a husband whose legal troubles were talked about a lot in town. Yet she was always so happy and relaxed to see us on Wednesday nights. Where did that joy come from? How did she live the power of the resurrection in a way that has stayed with me even now? You know, maybe Thomas will be forever known as doubting Thomas, but this morning I can't help but think that's so unfair. After all, when the apostles finally left the upper room, Thomas went further than any of the other ten. According to church tradition, anyway, he traveled as far as India. India. The apostle to India is one of his nicknames. That's further than Peter, further than Paul, further than Rome, to spread the good news of his risen Lord. The good news of Easter, that God's love for us is alive and stronger than any particular threat to our personal security, to our collective security. In that, perhaps, like me, you're hearing in Christ's invitation to Thomas, reach out your hand, a call to look anew at your own life in this Easter season. An invitation to gaze upon some of the wounds of your own. Fear, hopelessness, loneliness, for signs of new life. Maybe the call is for you to reach out your own hand in invitation to someone you know who's struggling with belief, to join us here with renewed commitment as we pray and as we break bread, as we join a growing movement here to work and witness against so much that is eating at the heart of our culture. The story of Thomas reminds us that this same fear, this same hopelessness, this same loneliness are the soil of resurrection. This is the good news of Easter. Christ is risen. As we journey together through these next 50 days, Christ wants to take us and our second thoughts right along with him into new and everlasting life. Amen. Standing together, we affirm the ancient faith of our church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.